so um, the clash for resources, in particular competition and cooperation over natural resources, is obviously a big topic. And I know many of you are experts in it, so I just want to highlight a few points. I mean, clearly we know that competition over natural resources has been going on for as long as human civilization has been going and has been an issue for conflict and cooperation in that context. The struggle for resources to control, to extract rents, and so on. Oil, gold, precious minerals, and of course, as we get moved towards contemporary debates, the increasing focus again on land, on water, particularly access to fresh water, and fisheries, forests. So I want to briefly introduce these points from a point of view of key themes for this security forum, and then we can take the debate forward. Um, so traditionally, because security traditionally has states and interstate rivalries have loomed large, uh, then issues to do with uh, interstate rivalries and co uh, competition over natural resources are clearly an extremely important theme and still relevant. Why are politics and alliances and uh, interventions so prominent a, a debating issue in the Persian Gulf because of oil being there as well as a whole range of other po points and gaps? Why is China so willing to create serious friction with its Southeast Asian neighbors, even though it's a high political priority to avoid that friction, over questions of sovereignty of the South China Seas and the Spratly Islands. Uh, the questions relate partly to questions of national pride and territory, but equally to issues of access to fisheries wealth under the new law of the sea and the prospects of oil and gas. So those tensions are there and they matter. I was just in a, a meeting yesterday uh, back in the UK which focused on how significant access to fresh water issues are in debates between Iraq and Iran now. As you know, the government of Iraq is Shia and has as close affiliations with the government of Iran. And yet, water issues have, have turned out to be an extremely hot focus of competition and rivalry between those two countries. Basically because Iran periodically blocks off uh, one of the main rivers that comes from, flow from Iran you know, through Kurdistan and then into central Iraq, destroy, having a very, very serious questions to do with uh, implications for the ordinary people in Iraq and food production there. And it's got very much tied up to do with sanctions and sanctions breaking. Uh, Iraq, uh, Iran, I understand, has then made it conditional access to water, conditional on Iraq, buying Iranian oil and gas, which seems incredible. Uh, as a way of generating income and circumventing sanctions. So there are many different examples of that. But what I want to focus on for the, my remaining initial two points are questions to do with land, fisheries, water, and those, more contempt, uh, those issues in relation to where I think the security issues are most prominent. The interstate tensions and bargaining over these issues is important, but so far, it appears they're not generally a source of war. They're a source of friction, but the instruments for governance, for conflict prevention, for management, have seemed sufficient in many areas to prevent war over questions of interstate rivalry over natural resources. Although, of course, it's a factor in international interventions and so on. Whereas, if you look underneath, within the state, and in fragile states and transitional states around the world, questions of competition for natural resources are central to many of the sources of fragilities and conflict within those countries. Now in this context, you have heard, there are the context of resource plenty, and there are contexts of resource scarcity. In a way, economists would say everything is always scarce, but in terms of the perceptions of local people. Where there's plenty, the debate is around the resource curse, which many of you have heard of. In Africa, for example, now, over the last 15 years, there have been many discoveries through new exploration of potentially rich oil and gas fields. A source of celebration, but also a source of anxiety, because immediately control of the states becomes access to control over those resources 
and in context of competition and corruption, it can cause problems in terms of well, the character of the government, coups, and so on. But with below the state, they also become sources of violence and confrontation underneath the state. Regions where those resources come from feel that they need their share. Often it goes to the country, and therefore Niger Delta and so on, or uh, Western Uganda now that the oil um, has been found there. Um, so there's a question of secessionism. But the area where I increasingly have worked over the last 15 years is below that, it's at the intercommunal level. The big nature is no water wars and forest wars and land wars in most areas, not likely. Conflicts, riots that can cause the deaths of tens of thousands of people sometimes, but are below the state, are happening all the time. And those are not only about natural resources, water, gas, there's nearly always questions of politics, uh, many other factors, but they're there. And where there's a resource abundance, the discovery of new alluvial diamond mines or whatever it is, then they become a factor in the conflict. But also, and this is my final point, where there's scarcity. In semi-arid areas, many people will be familiar that large stretches of Asia and Africa are semi-arid, where seasonally there is a great shortage of water, and therefore competition for access to water is a major focus for conflicts between pastoralist communities and between pastoralist communities and sedentary communities. Now into that complicated mix that is partly just competition over resources and partly reflects deep problems of governance and rights allocation and fairness in dispute settlement to do with access to these resources. In fragile states, often it's very unclear who owns this material land, whether the state has a role, whether the community does, does individually, and in that context you have a whole mess of conflicts which are very hard to resolve and injustice piling on injustice and feeding into a fragile state context which is challenging. And so given that one of the central challenges of any security forum around the world now is not only the interstate and the global security but it's a question of fragile states, conflict prevention and human security at that community level. Um, I have recently visited places which are deemed to be peaceful where in the last few months over 5,000 people have died. They're not wars, they're intercommunal conflicts. And I no, 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 where are you talking about? There I'm talking about South Somali region of Ethiopia, where I happen to be there. Uh, the Ethiopia, Somali region of Ethiopia is, a, uh, is in itself a place of insurrection, but in the south there isn't a war going on. But there are all sorts of inter-ethnic disputes about access to rivers and water uh, rights and also legitimate control over local district authorities and local state funding. And these, when we talk about human security, but also when we talk about fragile states and the risks of civil war, are big issues, and issues of land and water, forestry are there. And a final comment, these are global issues now because of course there's a global investment pattern going on. Wherever you go in these uh, countries, you'll find very high presence of Western companies, Chinese companies, Malaysian companies, Indian companies, and everybody's investing in land, because uh, agricultural land, because of the idea that food prices will go up. There's logging, there's so many other concessions, and these are important aspects of national development. Country, company, governments want to attract those investments, but it's having a very bad and insecure impact on a lot of the communities. This is not to stop those investments, but my final comment is what it means is that we need to think much more carefully about responsible investment in the context of fragile states in these areas. There are new initiatives there, but above all, conflict-sensitive investment. Investment that is aware of the context and aware that there needs to be a very real balance struck and, uh, between the rights of local communities, the rights of national development, and how to link development with conflict prevention. So those are my first few words. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much indeed for that, uh, which will throw us into how on earth we get there in a moment or two. John, do you want to use the, the lecture as well? That's great. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, the, the theme of this uh, session is uh, natural resources, confrontation or co cooperation. And of course the answer is that we will have confrontation unless we can work out cooperation. Uh, Western Europe turned confrontation into cooperation at the end of the Second World War. France and Germany shared their coal and steel industries, an act of great political courage which has since developed in the European community. 
with, uh, which has had many benefits, notwithstanding the difficulties which we've heard about this afternoon. Now, what was true for Europe then is true for the world today. We are all in the same boat. Um, we cannot resolve threats to our well-being, such as climate change or financial crisis, unless we develop a cooperation. Um, and we have to think how to create win-win situations. Um, climate change is a major challenge to our security. Think of the security implications. If drought forces tens of millions, possibly hundreds of millions of people to move. Um, attempts to reach international agreement are stuck at the moment. But a great deal is happening here in Europe and elsewhere in areas such as developing sustainable transport, clean energy. Uh, civil society is taking much leadership. You see, if we talk a bit more about land, at the, at the moment we are losing 1% of the world's agricultural land each year to erosion and other factors. Yet most of that land can be restored to life, thereby providing food and removing car carbon from the atmosphere and reducing conflict. Because if you look at areas of conflict, most of the world's conflicts are in the dry regions of the world. You see, if you look at Niger, uh, just south of the Sahara Desert, and faced with the creeping Sahara Desert destroying its fertile land, um, with climate change making things worse, but in recent years, Niger has restored 5 million hectares of land to productive use. And they've done it through a combination of traditional farmers using their knowledge of the land and good agricultural science. And that's important for the whole world, not just them. You see, when governments get stuck, as they are on this issue, a lot can be done at other levels. The power of civil society is growing thanks to the internet, and social media, and such trends. And so what we need to do, I think, is to put effort into ensuring that this trend, the growth of the power of civil society, is for the better. The answer to diminishing natural resources is to increase human resources. We need to put more effort into dealing with the root causes of insecurity in people. And those root causes, of course, are poverty, ill health, lack of education, lack of respect, corrupt governance, unhealed trauma. You could mention others. But if we want to heighten security, this is where we need to put our efforts. Uh, such things as implementing the Millennium Development Goals. Now, I take much hope for the future from the growth of civic responsibility in many countries. Uh, I was the Secretary of Australia's National Surrey Day Committee, which is a civic, civic movement which, despite government opposition, enlisted a million people in calling for an apology for cruel and misguided past policies to Aboriginal Australians. And it went on for 10 years with hundreds of civic events. Um, and gradually, we saw the government shift in their attitude. And when it came, the apology was a transforming event. At last, there is definite progress in overcoming the tragic conditions of Aboriginal Australia. When people feel respected, they start to take responsibility and discover answers to the problems their society faces. And that is key to any society getting on top of its problems. I was encouraged yesterday to meet a lively civic group of young professionals. They call themselves the Nestor Group. And they have come together to develop ideas for Ukraine. And uh, where they said that whereas many people look on our different cultures as a problem, they, say, they said we see them as a richness and an opportunity. And they've developed many interesting ideas, some of which are being implemented in civic development, for instance. And this trend is growing, uh, and it's a vital factor in security, because national security, in the end, depends on human security, on enabling every person to feel secure. Thank you. John, thank you. I, I want to just ask you a question about the, the power of civic societies. You discussed it there, because you draw on an issue with regard to indigenous Australians, in which, which has moved the government's own position. 
but that's not about resources, is it? And there is a, what can I call it, a need element or a greed element, whatever we might call it, to resources that people want and will go after. And they might not pay any attention at all to civil society movements either. And that's true, that's one of the things going on. At the same time, you can point to many situations where uh, civic society initiatives have grappled with greed. Uh, they've exposed corruption in many different situations. If you look at the work of Abaz, this uh, social network, I see that the latest campaign has got two million signatures on a campaign to prevent um, Montans, Monsanto taking control of really our seeds. Um, uh, th there, are, there is a lot that can be done at civic, civic society level to tackle that issue of greed. Thank you. Um, do you want to pick up on that? Is it enough? It's not enough, is it? Um, yes, is it working? Yes, it's, um, I mean, it's an important component, so I also um, in, engage in civil society activity and I think it's critical. But what experience shows when we're dealing with na everything, I suppose, but let's focus on natural resources here, is that um, 20 years ago, I think a lot of people felt the solution to reducing the clash over natural resources was to have very clear ownership of every bit of natural resource, which was a private owner, and then it would resolve this and somehow you'd be able to build on that. In a lot of areas of the world, it's been shown not to be the case. What you need is quite a complex partnership between government, national codes, and civil society in the community. And I think in that context, I can think of many examples of which I could elaborate, where civil society groups have played a very critical role in supporting, uh, in pre preventing conflict or supporting resistance against unjust exploitation of natural lands. But then they've had to do it through complex alliances with uh, exploiting international initiatives, exploiting uh, international media, which then gets international donors interested. But a mixture between international NGOs and local civic NGOs can often be very effective. So it's, it's for me, the civic society element is critical, but what's most critical is a dynamic linkage between the international, the national, and the local on these issues. Right. Uh, you brought up a few African examples, yes. and we do have, as we already know, Kuru uh, Alcott with us. But Kuru, would you like to say just a, a couple of words about the resources issue uh, from an African perspective? I mean, whichever country you want to pick, they've got minerals that others are dying to get their hands on, and they've got their own internal to regional issues with it as well. Or this one. Thank you, John. Okay, uh, let me begin by telling a story. In 1920, when Kenya was a colonial, I mean a colonial territory of the UK, uh, the British who were then colonizing Kenya went to this part of northern Kenya where I come from called Chukan. And then in 1920 they looked at Chukan and said, say, there is really nothing useful that can come out of control in the region called Tukana. That this is a useless place, the people are a problem, and so is the region, and it's a problem that is best to be transferred elsewhere. Now, fast forward, 50 years after independence, 1963, oil has been discovered in Tukana. And guess who is now speaking about Tukana almost in punctuation marks? Talo Oil, which is a British company. So, I mean, the question I want to bring to this debate is that I don't think there's any, there's any part in this world that is useless. Every part of the world is very important. I think every part has got its own time and when resources can be exploited. Now, that brings me to the debate about um, the, the confrontation or cooperation. The first point I want to make, and I think it's a challenge I want to bring to this, this forum, is I think the attempt to redefine what is global is a beginning of confrontation. Because you now need to say oil and gas is global and therefore involves all global citizens. And then people begin to say, but wait a minute, we have all along been global citizens for a considerable period of time, we have not benefited from the globality. What is global? So I think for me it's a big debate that we in Africa are saying, uh, we are now being considered citizens of the world because there is almost a reverse migration in terms of natural resources to Africa. So we are all equal citizens. There is a total disagreement because that redefinition is not coming in honest terms. That you need to redefine honest partnership 
not because you want to siphon or extract resources. This is the debate that is happening in, in our country. Certainly a debate is happening where I come from. Because people are wondering now, what is global about us? And, 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 and there are many issues that the, the global, I mean, the people who are coming with global definitions are taking advantage of one, weak institutions. They don't really want to encourage, the, the, they don't want to strengthen those institutions so that we can all exploit natural resources together you actually exploit them. Because now the truth be told, hydrocarbon exploration or oil, commonly known, is an insecurity in itself. And, and it's something that, uh, from the African continent, people are looking at it very carefully. Uh, uh, it's a blessing in disguise, Niger Delta happened. Everybody's saying we don't want to go the Niger way. But there seems to be resistance to agree on what are the mechanisms under which we can all exploit these resources for the common benefit of us, and the globe. Good, thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, we've quite pushed on time, so I just want, if, if you two would like to pick up on that as a, a final remark, really, because uh, we are running short on time. Oh, yeah. Okay, big issue, but you're moving on to it, and that's similar themes next time, so. Um, yes, I mean, I, I had my opportunity to speak, so let me just add something to what was being said then. I think from my perspective, um, there's no doubt that oil is the property of the sovereign territory on which it's found, and therefore, in that sense, it's not global. But for me, the big challenge of security is, as I say, a sub-state one. Um, who within the countries, uh, how are the concessions to exploit those resources, which are then, of course, globalized, as it is in a globalized context, allocated? And to what extent did, is the correct balance struck between the interests of the immediate local community, the interests of the elites within that country, the, the way in which the resources are then, um, are then used to provide real social benefits in terms of health and education. And so whereas I agree that there is one question which is worthwhile exploring, which is to not automatically assume this is a global resource, I think, for my money, that's not where the key security debates are. The key security debates are about um, our, our local debates. And about, and about how that then works through um, uh, in terms of how concessions are, are, are given. Um, and, uh, and obviously, in a buyer's market, uh, the, the, the supplier can, deter, can more or less set the terms in many ways as to how these concessions are given. But I work in many, many countries, as I'm sure many others of you do, not only in Africa, but in Latin America and in East Asia, where the ways in which those concessions are given are um, probably not very sustainable and also quite conflicts prone. And uh, so that's the challenge you're really. uh, Thank you, John. I think in tackling these issues, we've simply got to look at where can we play a part in getting things right in our situation. Uh, if you look at Africa, there's plenty of problems in Africa that they've got to tackle. But there's also in our uh, extractive industries, which go to Africa, uh, the amount of bribery, corruption that goes on means that we receive African minerals at a fraction of the price that we ought to pay Africa. Our factory fishing vessels go around the coast of Africa um, scooping up fish, which ought to be feeding Africans. These are things that we've got to deal with. They've got a lot to deal with themselves, but those are the issues where we've got to discover cooperation and say, and if we do that, then I think resources can benefit rather than be the curse that often they are. Thank you. John, thank you. Th th that, uh, our slot has gone by like a shot, I'm afraid. Uh, we are maintaining the issue of energy and energy security and resource in the course of uh, the rest of this session. But for now, I'd just uh, like you all to join me in saying thank you both very much to uh, everyone and to the